so I've never done this before and not sure whether it's a good idea or not, but I thought if we picked a specific topic, well, it doesn't seem like anybody's here yet, so I guess I'll wait. Looks like three people are here, so I'm going to wait probably till we get a few more or any relevant questions. Basically what I wanted this Q&A to be about is uh, the issue on the border, South America, and I've brought up some other relevant tabs to deal with um, Southcom, the statements of Admiral Tidd the guy who's basically in charge and has been involved with protecting our southern border. And to put in perspective my view versus his view, which is pretty much identical, which is actually saying a lot for a Navy guy and an Army guy, but how we both disagree with the administrator about the take on it. So I thought I would answer any relevant questions to the issue with the paltry amount of funding that goes into the 4th Fleet and into Southcom, and why I think that's a bigger threat to our national security than any issue in Asia, any issue in Europe or the Middle East. One of the things that I had brought up relevant to this, let's see if I can find it, is the posture statement. Now, it's a 31-page deal, and I'm just going to go down to page 27. I want to read you something that's absolutely just unbelievable in this day and age. I'm Pardon while I'm scrolling here. Well, the Panamanians do. We, uh, I mean, technically, they're the ones that receive all of the uh, funding, or excuse me, all of the fees that get charged to whatever vessel passes. So it's the Panama Canal Authority controls it and runs it. It's the government of Panama. But trying to find page 27 here, so give me one second. I just want to read something for you that I think you would find astounding. Almost there, 25, 26. All right, listen to this. Under operational support. Appreciate congressional support to our ISR program. Both will significantly enhance JITF's South current and upcoming operations. As referenced earlier, in fiscal year 2017, JITF South had precise geolocation on 1,167 targets, carrying 815 metric tons of cocaine that we could not respond to due to lack of assets. Now imagine that. 365 days in a year, and you have precise location on 1,167 individual targets carrying 815 metric tons of cocaine bound for the United States, and you can't do anything about it because you don't have the assets. Can you imagine that? I mean, think about that. I mean, does that make any sense? I mean, until we can do this, why bother with a wall? And this isn't me saying this. This is the uh, Admiral, Kurt Tidd. This is his statement. This is the, I'll go back to the top here as fast as I can. That's page 27 of Southcom Mill Portals Documents Posture, the statement. You can Google that as well. This is what he's saying. 
fiscal year 2017. And that's not, you can't blame that on Obama. That's fiscal year 2017. And it wouldn't necessarily be an Obama thing or a Trump thing or... Um, it's been a problem that's been endemic. We don't finance, we don't fund the fourth fleet. We don't fund Southcom the way that we should. And if we can't, if we have a Navy that has the ability to get specific information and targeting information on 1,100 plus targets, I'm not a troll, but why make the info more out there for our enemies? Which particular info are you talking about? In the, the info here in the posture statement, or are you referring to things that are uh, I dealt with during the investigation into the Fitzgerald? Well, I guess I can answer both. This is on the internet. This is USNI. Um, they put the information out first, not me. The assets we don't have. Okay, well, like I said, um, this is something you can find literally dozens and dozens and dozens of articles out there that talk about the problems in the Fourth Fleet that are out there. And it, it's not me putting it out. It's them putting it out. This isn't classified material. In fact, literally it says unclassified. And you can find it. Exactly. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make people aware of this issue because it's come to the forefront with this issue of the wall. Um, that even Mr. That even the Admiral says is not the answer. Oh, I know. I wasn't blaming you either. I'm just saying that uh, it's not. It's when I try to bring information to the forefront with. I mean, I don't have a whole lot of subs, but I have enough to maybe illuminate some things that we can maybe do better with the money. Yeah, you know, South America is an interesting place. Um, and thank you. There are areas of South America that are as different from Mexico as we are. Believe it or not, you go to a place like Peru, Chile, Argentina, and they're not all dark. They're, in fact, none of them are dark skinned. They're all light skinned. They're... Um, they trace their lineages back to Castilian Spain. And the way their economies run, the way that they think about the world, the way they see the world is 180 degrees from Cuba or Puerto Rico. So I'll just go back to the map, but real quick, just to, um, let's see if I can find this. Yeah, this was, a. Uh, a long time ago. This was March 10, 2016. This was Admiral Tidd. And, you know, so this goes back, you know, almost two, over two years where he was saying this. And down here, he was talking about, um, <clears throat> he was talking to a panel and he says he told the panel that border security with Mexico was not nearly as effective as we would like to be, of course. But he also said, a wall will not solve the problem indicating that improved sensors and other technologies that take into account terrain would be helpful. He also said the U.S. was working with Israelis on how to better identify and eliminate tunnels by smugglers. And this is the big thing that he and I both agree on. As he said several times, the long-term solution to the narcotics problem and also a migration crisis brought on by people fleeing the violence in their communities was reducing the demand inside the United States. This is from the Admiral in charge of the Fourth Fleet. Now, you don't have to believe me. If the Admiral in charge of the Fourth Fleet, the guy who's been in charge of protecting our southern border with the Navy, says this, maybe we should listen to him. Maybe we should listen to an Admiral who's been doing it for 30 years. This was something that a lot of Trump supporters said, well, look, you know, Trump's surrounding himself with generals and he's going to surround himself with people who know about the military. Well, okay, then let's do that. Let's talk to the guys who know what they're, what they're doing. You know, and that actually reminds me of something. 
Are you ready for it? R U R D Y for I T. Uh, her last video she did yesterday, or I believe, or day before, perhaps, talks about where there was an actual expert talking to a uh, a government official about something, and he absolutely owns the guy, just absolutely destroys him. And this is what I would like to see a lot more of: people that really know the issue, people who've served down there, people who've been down there taking our politicians to task on their talking points. The specific issue, are you ready for it, was talking about was how the Iranians are now benefiting from the money we're sending to Iraq. It's absolutely insane. I also brought up, I thought I had brought up countries by aid. I did. Hold on. We can't, we have fiscal year 2017, not enough money to stop over 1,100 targets carrying, what was it, 80, 850 metric tons of tote cocaine. Let's see, don't worry, everyone in this world knows how to find this readiness information in the U.S. Well, right, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet that's a lot, the reason that I do this channel um, the way that I do it with the phone pointed at the screen is so that half of the screen isn't taken up with my face. I want people to say, well, when I go to the Florida Maquis, I see information, not him. I mean, I narrate the information, and I show you where you can go to find it. I can show you what you can do to Google it, to go out and search on your own and dig up the information on your own. But like I said, if we have all of these billions and billions and billions of dollars to send to all of these countries and to invest in all of these countries, but the Fourth Fleet cannot stop known targets because it doesn't have enough funding. It's okay if you play Candy Crush. What's that? I don't even know what that means. But there was also something I wanted to reveal on this live that I thought was very interesting, and I want your guys' opinion on it. Um, let's see if we can go back to the four statement. Well, I know what Candy Crush is. I just don't know how it's relevant here. Okay. That statement there about the thousands and thousands of illegals walking across the border and staying is completely false. Of the people that come into this country every year, the vast majority of them come through the border crossings. They're smuggled through in cars. They're smuggled through in trucks. The vast majority of them will be coming through the border crossings that will still be there if there's a wall or not. That's what they don't tell you. A very small percentage of them actually just amble across out in the middle of the wilderness. And you can look that statistic up if you want. I wish I would have brought up the tab. But if you look at all of the illegal drugs and the people coming here, the vast majority of them come through the Gulf, where there would be no wall, where there's no possible way to be a wall. This is the thing. They, show, they talk about this caravan of migrants. It's a couple hundred people. There are thousands and thousands that come here smuggled through trunks and in the backs of trucks that come through the border crossings that even if the wall could be completed tomorrow, those border crossings will still be there and we don't have the resources or the financing to stop all of these trucks, to stop all of these cars and search them. That's the big lie. Now... Page 23 of this. Who out there remembers the ARA San Juan, the submarine that went missing? The Argentinian sub? Okay, true, but the wall is a start. Okay, it's going to take, if they started building right now, 10 years. And 10 years and $25 billion conservatively. 
if we have that kind of money to spend, a tenth of that could recapitalize the fourth fleet and do so much more than, than just piling bricks out in the middle of the desert. And I hate to say it, but the guy's not going to be president forever. And you know how our country goes. We swing from eight years of left, eight years of right, eight years of left, eight years of right. It just happens. That wall wouldn't even be a tenth built by the time he leaves office and the next person is going to use it. As, well, exactly. You can tunnel under a wall no matter what. And so it's never going to be fully built. And here's the thing, and here's what I want to ask a lot of the wall supporters out there while I scroll through here to page 23. The day after, let's say we could drop it all tomorrow and put it all up and it's completely, you know, all the way from Texas, all the way to San Diego, done. And then the next day, some illegal alien who's still here commits a crime. What are you going to say then? I know what the left-wing media is going to say. They're going to say, see, we built this entire wall, we wasted $25 billion, and we still have problems with people not, you know, behaving like they should that are illegal aliens. They don't call it Mexifornia because of the drugs. Okay, well, once again, that's an issue. That's even a bigger issue down there. That's the issue. I'm a big states rights guy. Let, if it's the federal government's job, to keep them from coming into the country, then let the federal government do their job at the border. But if they fail and they don't do their job at the border and people do get through, this doesn't give the federal government the right to send these Stasi squads into cities in a sovereign state and say, okay, local police force of blah, 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 California City, you need to start turning over all of your records to us, and you need to start cooperating and doing what we say because we lost track of this illegal or that illegal or this other illegal at the border. Because that, that's exactly what's happening. We talk about ICE going in and the FBI going in and all these, these federal agencies going into states, into their cities, and saying, okay, now, basically, you're going to do this and this and this and this for us, this federal agency. And the state of California is like, hell no. Sorry, we're a sovereign state. Your job was at the border. And if you didn't do, the federal government didn't do its job at the border, then, sorry, now it's, now it's to the states. If Texas wants to deal with it one way, fine. If New Mexico another, that's fine too. But I'm sorry, I stopped scrolling. Um, but it's an important thing to understand. We cannot give the federal government this license and this leash to go into any state they want to and start dictating to cities what they can and can't do with their police forces. Their state-financed police forces. But anyway, I'm sorry, ARA San Juan. I know, I'm kind of, this is why I don't do lives. is because I get off on tangents and I have to really discipline myself. All right, let's see. It's coming up here. Will you read this? I don't know if this was him misspeaking or not. But let's see if I can find it here. All right, here we go. Listen to this. Rapid response. Okay, and the girl that got killed by an illegal in Cali. Are you talking about the um, that girl that uh, worked? Trump started talking about it, the um, the issue with the, the homeless kid. Yeah, this Kate Steinle thing. Well, first of all, in that particular issue, it wasn't a murder. It was this homeless guy had found this gun, and it was an accidental discharge. Ballistics proved that, that it bounced off this the concrete and hit her accidentally. And whether it was this homeless guy or some other homeless guy, it was just some homeless guy. He didn't, he wasn't the one that stole it, the gun. And who the hell leaves a gun in their car anyway? You know, it's... But anyway, let me read this. Yeah, it did. Absolutely did. Go read the article. 
It was an accidental discharge, and she was hit off of a ricochet. Okay, right. He was some sad old homeless man that had wandered his way up there. And like I said, the job of the federal government is to stop this at the border. Once they beat the federal government at the border, I'm going to make that that defense lawyer's argument not the truth. Well, the guy was found not guilty. Well, I mean, it wasn't murder. It absolutely was not a murder. The guy didn't go steal a gun and go, go kill somebody. It was an accidental discharge, period. And you can go look that up. But anyway, listen to this. Of the truth came out. Could you imagine the bath like the truth came out? All right. Anyway, ARA San Juan. Has anybody read this and seen the problem here? Our ability to rapidly respond and provide unique capabilities also allow us to demonstrate our steadfast commitment to the region. Last year, joined by the UK, Chile, and others, we assisted Argentina in the search and recovery of the submarine ARA San Juan. The search and recovery of the ARA San Juan. I didn't realize they'd recovered it. And this is from the, this is the transcript of the force posture statement for Southcom delivered in February. And this was his quote. I thought they never found it. Last year, joined by the UK, Chile, and others, we assisted Argentina in the search and recovery of the submarine ARA San Juan. Now, this could maybe just be him misspeaking, but it sounds to me like maybe he slipped here. And look, this whole issue with, uh, as far as crime, it, whether the person <laughs> who attacked you is supposed to be here or not, I don't know anyone that uh, would be any more or any less at a loss one way or the other. This is something the media does. Yeah, I know, right? I did, this. Do you read this the same way as I do? It says search and recovery. And this is the first place I've ever seen this referred to this way. You know, and I just, and I'll leave this here with the Kate Steinle thing. Um, I remember when that first got reported, the first person that, uh, well, thanks, appreciate you hanging out. Um, I'm Army and that is what it is. Meaning that you agree with me that that's search and recovery, that they recovered it. That they're not just saying search and recovery as a generalized blanket term for just the search. Because why would you say we assisted Argentina in recovery? Yeah, exactly, right. But um, the first person that came out and started yammering on about the Kate Steinle thing was um, O'Reilly. And he had pretty much referred to the thing and tried to want to... Uh... Yeah, I know, I didn't either. But this is uh, page 23 of the uh, Southcom force posture statement when he was testifying before Congress. So I thought this was an interesting thing to bring up that the ARA San Juan was actually recovered and nobody reported it. And this uh, admiral slipped in his forced posture statement talking about something tangential to what he was really talking about. Yeah, no kidding.
because I think he would have just said if, if we, we, assist, we assisted Argentina in the search for the submarine. Well, yeah, but clearly. Well, you know, that's kind of funny because the uh, USS Kearsarge is in the Gulf at an undisclosed location at the moment. Now, I know it's Fleet Week in New Orleans, so I don't want to make a giant, humongous deal about that. The ARA San Juan, how did it sink? God knows. Maybe it never did. You see, that's the thing. I mean, you know, maybe it was something where it was just commandeered. Maybe there was a mutiny. Maybe there was... I mean, a whole bunch of things could have happened. You know, maybe that uh, EMP issue that was over in the off the coast of Japan with the Fitzgerald, maybe they EMP to sub, made it surface. Captured it that way. So, anyway. Um, but yeah, last thing, Kate Steinle. Um, you know, that was pretty much what put Trump on the map, was that issue with Steinle. And before any investigation was done into it, before anybody had the chance to look into the details, the facts of the case... It was already a conviction. It was supposed to be a murder. I mean, the guy was literally talking about it like it was basically a murder. I mean, he couldn't use the words, but that's what he was saying. And now that the actual facts of the case has come out, that it wasn't, the guy, and that the the shot was fired from major distance. I mean, this guy didn't just walk up to a girl, point a gun at her, shoot her, and rob her. That isn't what happened. He was at a distance, and the gun was not even pointed at her. It was pointed at the ground, and the trigger was pulled, and it ricocheted, and it hit her. And it was horrible. I mean, yes, well, negligent, well, no negligent, negligent discharge is not murder. <laughs> it's negligent homicide. Murder is contemplated. Murder shows intent. Hmm. Yeah, it could very well be. There's a whole lot of uh, stuff that... Yeah, it's... um. You know, nobody bothered to give the guy the day in court. And, and here's the thing, and I really want a lot of Trump supporters to think about this. And think about it honestly. When our Constitution was written, there were no delineations of citizenship. Involuntary manslaughter, thank you. Or even negligent homicide, either way. But when our Constitution was written, there were no delineations for U.S. citizens versus what the non-U.S. citizens, the U.S. That's why all of the the words used are people and persons, not citizens. It says, we believe that all men, that, that these truths be self-evident, that all men, not all citizens, are created equal and are endowed by their creator, once again, meaning all men, life, liberty, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and it also says that no person, not citizen, no person shall be deprived of of life, liberty, or property without due process. And you see, that's... And you can't say... I've, I've showed that clip of the Patriot, where they were talking about this. At that time, there was there were 13 different disparate states. And at that time, there was no real nation, no uh, singular nation that had its, its uh, lines drawn out for people that were living within its borders versus people that were not. All you had to do at that time to be part of the U.S. was just show up, because that's what happened. I mean, can anyone take issue with that at the time when the uh, Constitution was written and that it was put into place that there was, when people came here, you know, in the early 1800s, that they had to go through any kind of a naturalization process? No, they just showed up here 
and by virtue of living here, were protected and had constitutional rights. And that was South Carolina all the way to Connecticut, New Hampshire. Well, I mean, all the way up and down the coast. It didn't, there was no citizenship, U.S. citizenship at the time. So when they said the right of the people to keep and bear arms, they didn't say the right of citizens. They didn't say the right of U.S. citizens only, and if you live, you know, outside of the 13 colonies, but on this continent, you don't enjoy these protections. Because how could you say that the rights were given by God, but then guaranteed by legal, guaranteed by government? That made absolutely no sense. I brought up this article, too, talking about this, the opioid crisis. where they pretty much report the same thing. And this is February 15th of this year that they talk about this huge opioid crisis, but the problem isn't the lack of a wall. The problem is the lack of funding for defending our southern border. Sorry, I'm trying to get this camera right here. Latin American partnerships have yielded pretty good situational awareness on most drug trafficking to the U.S. However, he said, of the known tracks, we're only able to intercept 25% of them. And this is where they're trying to communicate this to our government, that why do we have all of these millions and millions and billions of dollars to send to Africa and to the Middle East when the issue with our border is financing in the Fourth Fleet. You can ask Admiral Kurt did this, and I know I'm going to reiterate this a lot because we have a lot of new people joining the live, and so I don't want to be re repeating for everybody who's still here, but I think it's important to understand this. And if anybody has any relative questions, any specific questions even about other issues, I mean, feel free. But let's see if I can find this. Go back to the Southcom statement. He talks about, and this is the Admiral speaking. Let's see what page we're on here. Page 16. He does. He goes through here and talks about working with, working with nations south of us to protect our border and this is where i think a lot of you misunderstand me and this probably i'll take some uh fault for this there are threats there absolutely are threats coming from the south i don't believe these people are all horrible and evil but there are problems but you don't fix the problems by isolating yourself from the people or isolating yourselves from the country. And so even ones you don't agree with, even ones that have things going on that you wouldn't uh, necessarily want going on in your country, you don't withdraw. You don't alienate. You don't uh, call names. You know, and in case anyone has any questions... You know, feel free to type them, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to basically start reading this to see if there's something that we can illuminate, that maybe something will click and you can understand where I'm coming from on this. This is, now I'm going to be quoting, of course, this is Admiral Tidd, um, and I will paraphrase, you know, some of the things that are a little bit more verbose. We'll start down here, actually. Yet the combined impacts of defense spending caps, nine years of continuing resolutions and insufficient spending in the diplomacy and development arenas make it increasingly difficult to sustain this regional network, speaking of Latin America, because our global security responsibilities outpace the resources available to meet them, we have had to make a series of tough choices resulting in compounding second and third order effects. 
The net result is the perception among our friends, and I've used this term before, the net result is the perception among our friends and the palpable anticipation among our competitors that we no longer stand by our commitments, that we are relinquishing our strategic position, and that we don't take the challenges in this region seriously. This is Admiral Kurt Tidd speaking here. On the surface, these regional challenges may not seem directly related to the larger, glo larger global challenges that dominate headlines and policymaking. They don't always fit neatly in our strategic frameworks as they blur the line between crime and war, competition and conflict, and simmering problems and crises. Agreed. Absolutely agreed, writers. Left unchecked, however, their impacts compound over time, emboldening competitors in other theaters, draining cap capabilities needed in other high-priority missions, and taxing our economic strength. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we must address evolving security challenges to help hold the line in this hemisphere and ensure a crisis within it doesn't distract from our ability to address even higher priority global challenges elsewhere. We should not make assumptions that the future will be as generous to our interests in this region as the past, which means we need to decide how much security is acceptable in a part of the world so closely linked to the U.S. homeland. Unless we decide... We may open ourselves to exploitation by our adversaries, erode our competitive edge, and in the case of this theater, as well as expose our southern flank to a well-understood range of vulnerabilities. Can I address what's happening with the U.S. bombing in Syria on a Q&A that literally says Southcom, really? All right. Real quick on Syria. The issue is, well, gosh, thank you, take that. I didn't really, wow, two bucks, hey, I'll take it. Awesome. Um, appreciate that. There's, Syria is a complicated thing. I would love to do a separate Q&A on that. I really would because I'm sitting here reading about Southcom and basically, oh my goodness, how do I, how do I deal with this? You know, a real good place to go if you want to get really great answers about Syria is a channel called Are You Ready For It? R-U-R-D-Y-4-I-T. Incredibly smart woman. Um, does really amazing work on this. And definitely, definitely check out her channel. Maybe I'll do a Q&A on the Middle East, but right now we're doing Southcom. Um, but thank you for the question. I, I appreciate it. Um, challenges and opportunities, security environment, Latin American, Caribbean is a region of contrasts of both positive and concerning trends. It is not one homogenous place. Thank you so much for saying that. That's the biggest misconception. But many disparate communities, home to modern, diverse, democratic societies with a growing middle class and professional, capable militaries. Yet it faces governance challenges. Yes, that too. Including political corruption, unmet development goals, and shocking levels of violent crime that create a permissive environment for illicit and other concerning activities. The global threat of violent extremism has gained a small foothold within Latin America's growing Muslim populations. Groups such as the Islamic State and others will likely continue recruiting fighters or inspiring others to carry out attacks in their home countries. Insecurity and economic hardship continue to drive migration while overall trends are returning to extort norms. Migration from the Northern Triangle across the U.S.-Mexico border is once again on the rise. Natural disasters regularly impact vulnerable countries, exacerbating struggling economies, and Venezuela remains at risk for internal instability, which could have significant regional ramifications. You see, I understand the concept by which they want to do the sanctions and they want to put out this idea that we're not going to support this guy who's allegedly a dictator. But the end result is you make a million enemies in the process. Because these people have had to stand up their own communes. They have had to basically work with just themselves. And while they may not like Maduro, they're going to hate the U.S. even more. Because of what I've been able to show with Colombia. Incredibly hypocritical stance, sending them half a billion dollars a year. Yes, it actually is the first Q&A. And... Uh, trying to stick to Q&A, dealing with South America and Central America, but, you know, throw it out there. If there's uh, questions about 
you know, any of the naval issues. Um, basically, anything I'll cover, I guess I'll give it a shot. But if I haven't covered it, probably not. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's the issue down there. Um, Venezuela was a sovereign nation. At one time, had the most advanced electrical system in the hemisphere. They exported aluminum. They, I mean, these South American countries weren't these third world, what you call shithole countries. They're at one time, Buenos Aires had the highest GDP capita in the world. I mean, it was right on par with Manhattan. It's not a place that people aren't educated and people don't understand what's going on. All that seems to make the news is gangs out of El Salvador and Guatemala and Mexican cartels and all this kind of stuff. You don't see the beauty of the region. You don't see the, the incredible resilience of the people. And they're very Christian folks. I mean, militantly Christian, some of them. So, yeah, exactly. You know, this is one of the things that happened in Venezuela. They kicked out, they realized how corrupt the DEA was, kicked them out. Realized how corrupt the CIA was, kicked them out. Homeland Security went down there, they got kicked out. No U.S. military bases allowed. And they didn't buy the petrodollar nonsense. And I know a lot of you understand the petrodollar and the issues with it, but let me explain for those who don't. The petrodollar is the U.S. reserve currency, the world reserve currency. To purchase oil, you had to take your currency and you had to convert it into the U.S. dollar and then buy oil. Well, when everybody in the world has to first buy your currency, that drives up artificially the value of the currency against their currencies. So in essence, what you were doing is every time you were taking a little slice of the value of that they had created with their currency just for them to buy oil. And not buy oil from you, buy oil from anyone. And that's why places like Venezuela said that petrodollar is criminal. Because it was. It was legalized theft. So... Anyway, to keep going, um, here it talks, of course, about MS-13, and um, and here's the part I think a lot of you, it actually makes my point for me. Criminal networks move drugs and engage in a wide array of illegal activity, including weapons trafficking, chemical importation, poppy and coca cultivation, fentanyl smuggling, and illegal mining. This is the... Um, force posture statement from um, Admiral Kurt Tidd that he read before Congress in February, basically outlining how poorly funded the Navy is and the Coast Guard is on our southern border. It's a place called the Fourth Fleet. Um, Japan has the Seventh Fleet. And basically we started here because there was a place down on page 27 we had covered earlier that in fiscal year 2017, they had geo spatial coordinates on 1,167 targets smuggling 850 tons of cocaine into the United States and they could not interdict a single one of them because of lack of funding. And that's why we're talking about this. So, anyway, um, southcom.mil portals, documents, posture statement, you can find it there. But what this part that we're talking about here now is is that these MS-13, 18th Street target, they kill in police officers in Central America and routinely communicate with counterparts in, it is for the dollar, uh, or excuse me, for the petrodollar for oil it is, and it has been for a long time. Um, anyway, street targets kill in police officers in Central America and routinely communicate with counterparts in places like Massachusetts, Virginia, New York, New Jersey, and Maryland to direct operations on U.S. soil. So what does that tell you? If these gangs are communicating with people on the East Coast, where do you think they're coming through? That's right, they're coming through the East Coast. They're coming up through Florida. And 
I think this part of the statement, you know, illustrates that, that we have an issue, a greater, much greater issue with the East Coast, Florida, um, the Panhandle, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, you know, the Gulf Coast of Texas, places that the wall wouldn't do anything for. And like I said, it's, um, did Venezuela start a coin a um, long time ago? Well, you see, that's the thing. Do um, you see activity where you live, FM? What type of activity? Gang activity? It's all over the place. I don't even, I don't even go anywhere near Jacksonville because of gang activity. But there was a place down here talking about China. You see, and this is what happens when the U.S. starts making blanket statements like, um, you know, everybody south of our border is a criminal and a rapist and a thief. Um, yeah, I live quite a way south of Jacksonville. I live way, way down south of St. Augustine, and I have virtually no reason to ever be up there. But, um, you know, there's gang activity. There's a lot of local gang activity up there. That really has nothing to do with the immigration. But one thing that I can tell you, um, I shuttle a lot of pilots around. I drive for ride share in the evenings for extra cash. And there's pilot schools here. And a lot of these pilots tell me that they fly up and down the coast all the time. And the east coast of Florida is just peppered with airfields that aren't on any maps. There's just airfield after airfield after airfield out in the middle of nowhere on the east coast of Florida that they don't have any charts for. Right, I mean, and, you know, if I would be all for, you know, if let California do what California wants to do. I don't think that a this issue with immigration is, needs to be one um, panacea thing that, you know, fits everybody. Because we basically have four states that have to deal with the issue. Texas. Yeah, I know, right? Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And like I said, it's, you know, you're right, immigration is absolutely a federal issue. However, the federal governments, and I'll say this again, sanctuary states, listen to this closely, their job, the federal government's task, their job, begins and ends at the border. If they don't do their job, if someone gets through that border, they do not, they do not have the authority to send thugs like ICE and any other federal agency into local communities a thousand miles away from the border and go into their police departments and say, okay, now you're going to give us these records and you're going to give us those records and you're going to turn this person over and that person. Uh-uh. The federal government doesn't have that authorization to go into a state Look at the definition of the border by the Supreme Court. Oh, brother, how did somebody interpret that differently? Of new missiles that are traveling away from traditional ballistic patterns. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? It's, uh... If we start giving the federal government license to just randomly, in the name of border, quote-unquote, security, go into any local jurisdiction and dictate to local authorities what they can and can't do, how they can and can't hold people, without the state asking them to come in, that opens... The, I mean... <laughs> What would be the point of posse comitatus? Forget states' rights, then. 
why would the federal government even bother reinvesting in the border? Reinvesting in making their doing their job better at the border when they, they know they can go into any locality and dictate to local police forces what they can and can't do. But anyway, what's actually on the screen here? Interstate commerce is interstate commerce. That has nothing to do with immigration. China's commercial and diplomatic advances move it closer to its larger strategic goal of reshaping global economic and governance architectures. China, listen to this, guys. Listen to this. China has pledged $500 billion in trade with Latin American countries and $250 billion in direct investment over the next 10 years. Think about that. $50 billion in trade and $250 billion in direct investment. And this, and what we're reading here, is the Admiral of the Fourth Fleet. This is what he's saying is a threat. And look, I know you guys are thinking, oh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Once again, Admiral Tidd, been involved in protecting our southern border for 30 years. Been in the military for longer than that. He's been through, he's been in the military through Reagan and both Bushes and Clinton and Obama. So this isn't particularly um, political with him, but this is his... You're venting? What do you mean I'm venting? Well, right, but I mean... Why... You have to ask my question then. If all the U.S. government has to do is claim border security to send in federal troops, which basically ICE is, into any state for any reason... What what would be their incentive to do their job better at the border crossings to stop people? You know the number one money maker in Florida, of course, is tourism. You know what the number two money maker is prisons. We'll protect the border at the border. I mean, if you have a military objective of protecting a line, and you say, okay, nobody crosses this line. Do you invest money in your own failure? Do you say, okay, we're going to, uh, our job is to stop them here, but we're also going to put a whole bunch of soldiers and, you know, trigger happy. I think you've asked that question twice. It's up to, you know, at least as much as the seventh fleet for sure. It's the number, it's like the lowest invested um, fleet. And I have tried to look the investment numbers up by num up by uh, you know by fleet, but given that in this particular report he says that the only real surface assets he has are Coast Guard cutters, I think we could do a better job. But anyway, let me read you this guy's about Russia. Russia's increased role in our hemisphere is particularly concerning given its intelligence and cyber capabilities intent to upend internal stability and order and discredit democratic institutions. Now, once again, Admiral, Fourth Fleet, 30 years. Russia is a strategic competitor actively seeking to degrade U.S. partnerships and undermine U.S. interests in the region. Moscow attempts to falsely shape Latin America's information environment through its two dedicated Spanish-language news and multimedia services and through its influence campaigns to sway public sentiment. Expanded port and logistics access in Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela provide Russia with persistent pernicious presence, including more frequent maritime intelligence collection and visible force projection in the Western Hemisphere. The sanctuary of robust relationships with these three countries provide Russia with regional platform to target U.S. and partner nation facilities and assets, exert negative influence over undemocratic governments, and employ strategic operations in the event of a global contingency. 
left unchecked, Russian access and placement could eventually transition from a regional spoiler to a critical threat to the U.S. homeland, Admiral Kurt Tidd, literally two months ago. I don't know how you argue. You can argue with me. You can't argue with the Admiral. This threat from Venezuela is, I'm telling you right now, going to be the worst thing that's ever happened in this country. Because I know a lot of people think Venezuela, and they think, oh, Venezuela, Guatemala, same thing. And I've tried to show how different those two countries are. Here it talks about Iran. Right, there's a little difference between the the, the, US, the USA does it. Is that supposed to be some kind of moral equivalence argument? That we're just supposed to, well, since they do it and we do it, we should just let it go on? Is, is that supposed to be how we, we take that? Iran seeks to expand its diplomatic... Oh, hey, okay, everyone does it. Yep, okay, so then I guess we just ignore it. Is, is that what's, what you're supposed to be saying there? Not everyone does it. And if we have any sense in our head, we will stop it. Or at least we will address it. Anyway, Iran. Iran seeks to expand its diplomatic relationships and trade and investment opportunities. Having a footprint in the region also allows Iran to collect intelligence and conduct contingency planning for possible retaliatory attacks against U.S. or Western interests. Lebanese Hezbollah maintains an established logistical, facilitating, fundraising, and operational presence in this region that can be quickly leveraged with little or no warning. And of course, we don't need to talk about Cuba. Everybody knows. This talks about the issue that's been warned to death about Venezuela. You see, it's that... Uh, yeah, right, because Israel has threatened to wipe us off the map. Really? And what this really talks about here is he goes through all of the different countries down there and he talks about how we've worked with them, how we've uh, created partnerships and we've trained together and we could be leveraging our partnerships down there to win this, to at least have the primary foothold down there so that they wouldn't see us. And, I mean, well, look, I mean, imagine a Russian reading this. Okay, you imagine a Russian reading this. It's the same. I mean, <laughs> apparently you've never been a soldier or an airman or marine or whatever. You can't say, well, I mean, I'm here protecting my country, but it's just as good for him to protect his country, so it's the same thing. It's not, I mean, who is they and who is, if you're confused about who is who, then I can't fix you there. But this is a great thing to read. It really is. Why is the U.S. where? In Central America? Or in South America? Or where? Right, and here's another... On any given day in the Eastern Pacific, in fiscal year 2017, JITF South had, on average, 2.9 force packages available to respond to illicit traffic events and was typically only able to seize or interdict only 1 in 31 of those events. The sheer volume of illicit traffic events far outmatches the force packages available to deal with them. Well, why are we in South America? Well, we have allies down there. We have allies. We're not occupying Argentina. We're not occupying Chile. 
We're not occupying Paraguay. My only issue is this, is that, yes, actually, believe it or not, the Chileans are our allies. The Argentinians are our allies. There are countries down there that don't like us very much, Bolivia, Venezuela. But the big difference is, if look, and if we were giving all of them the exact same amount of money, like, say, okay, $10 million for all of them, then there would be no hypocrisy. But when we give Colombia almost half a billion dollars a year, and the rest of all of those countries, all they're down there combined, don't even come up to a fourth of that, then there's a problem. Especially when we specifically target one out, like Venezuela, and say, okay, now... Now, and I want you to think about this. When was the last time the U.S. criminalized buying a currency? Can you think of it? Or investing in a country? If you were to go down there right now and say you wanted to donate X amount of money, you'd be charged with a crime. Seriously, why did they have to criminalize the Petro? So, Cuba's been going on for a long time. You know, that's a, that's a big question right there. Cuba, question mark. And I, you know. As we go through this. Yeah, amen. And I don't understand why this is even something that's a question. If... The current administration really wants to, right away, get a win, get a big win for the southern border. The Petro wasn't forced on the South Americans. The Petro was created by the Venezuelan government. It wasn't required that you buy it, but it was illegal to purchase it, to purchase it with the U.S. dollar. It wasn't about, it wasn't forced on anyone. The Petro is a Venezuelan thing. The Chile doesn't have anything to do with it. Brazil doesn't have anything to do with it. And besides, they have their, they actually already had their own. It's called the Sucre. I heard read the U.S. had a hand in removing Brazil's president, True or no? Are you talking about the one that uh, Lula da Silva? If it's Lula da Silva, then there was probably some, yeah. This whole thing with the Odebrecht paper. Yeah, Sucre, sugar, I know, right? That's the name of their crypto. The Sucre's been down there for years. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there was tons of corruption in Brazil, and you never heard the U.S. talking about criminalizing investment in Brazil. You never heard anybody talking about criminalizing, purchasing the currency of... Paraguay. Especially given a lot of the crap that we've pulled down there. So yeah, page 18. Um, let's see, we will train funders. That disappeared. The comments disappear really, really quick on my screen. And, uh, so if I don't respond to them, if they're a long question, then sorry. I... A value-based currency. Funny you say that. It's tied to a barrel of oil. It's the one cryptocurrency in the world that's actually backed by a commodity. And like I said, everybody, when it first came out, said, oh, it's a ripoff, oh, it's a scam, oh, it's a ripoff, oh, it's a scam. Well, guess what? The Russians are accepting it. They're going to be sending boatloads of stuff into Venezuela and being paid with this crypto. So is the U.S. right or is the U.S. wrong? So... Anyway, we are an hour and five minutes into this question and answer. Um, 
I see a lot of statements I'm trying to deal with, but uh, not a whole lot. I mean, I've answered some questions, I guess, but... You know, and here's something, too, that it goes to more of a, a peacetime military. No, not the Petro. What should we be doing right now? Um, we as a country, we as a people, we as the Maquis. Individually. Well, I would suppose that would uh, probably depend on your situation. What I would recommend everyone do, and this is something that will really wake you up. <clears throat> when you see something that you want to look up on the internet and you want to get some more information on, you can do something that a lot of people don't know they can do. You can go into search tools and you can look up the history of something simply by, um, let's see if I can find a way to do it here. Okay, here's your normal Google search page, right? Country Van David, okay, yeah, hostage. Connect, you can't hold it, you don't own it, bad idea. Right, okay, now, what I have to do, because I'm using a, hold on. Let's see here. Um, let's just say we're talking about... Um, look up Rothschilds. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's funny. This thing called... Is it... N-I-X-I-V-M? Okay, that thing with the... Uh, this cult? Now... If I searched now, here's what, let's see, we'll just go ahead and go. All right, everybody knows about this actress, right? Okay, now, these are the most recent results. Watch this. Search tools. Go down here to, hold on, desktop site. You see this thing here called tools? Watch this. Anytime, custom range, you can search from 2000, this year, to 2008. It's called the Petro. Okay, so 2000 to 2008. Now watch this. Now these are all the results that come up for this Nexium, this um, issue with this actress and this, this cult, right? But this has been going on for a long time. And I do this a lot to look up stuff. But strangely enough, you will find sometimes there's a lot of fake news out there. Because I'll see results from 2003 talking about this actress who wasn't even born yet. Look at this. Smallville star Kristen Crook allegedly bought Allison Mack into Nexium, right? Look at the date. January 22, 2004. Now, how could that possibly have been 14 years ago? Can somebody explain that to me? Um, China is spending in South America. It was $500 billion in promised trade over the next 10 years and $250 billion in direct investment over the uh, 
next 10 years. So $25 billion a year direct investment, $50 billion a year in promise trade. Yeah, exactly. Time travel, right. And like I said, you can do this for any topic and you will be stunned at things that you find that won't come up in normal search. If you really want to blow your mind about something, try this with Pizzagate. Because if you Google with one of these tool searches like this, where you don't get any results past 2008, you'll find out what the original Pizzagate was. I don't know if any of you can really remember this. Do you remember when Sarah Palin and Donald Trump went and had dinner and had pizza? And apparently Mr. Trump was eating pizza with uh, a fork and a knife. Now, basically that makes sense for the time because he was trying to stick with an Atkins diet, didn't want to eat the crust. So it was no big deal, but it was called Pizzagate because he went to dinner with his family and Sarah Palin's family and they had pizza and he was eating it with a knife and fork. So, but you won't find any references anywhere on the internet to Hillary Clinton or Pizzagate or this Nexium stuff until Trump announces for president. What's happening in Syria tonight? I don't care. I, is something going on that I don't know about? It says God name is jealous now in there. I don't even know what that means. So point being is that you can search for things. Like, well, we'll try it. You're going to get January 1. 2000 to December 31, 2008. All right. Let's do, let's just go ahead and do it. Pizza Gate. Clinton. Okay. Pizza Gate Clinton. Okay. Now. These are references to things that are happening, that were happening recently, but the dates are from 10 years ago. Who's dreaming? See, like this one here. This is an article, a recent article in the last two years, but it's dated 2007. So, anyway, I guess I'll just leave it there since we've kind of got off the Southcom thing, and I'm basically into this now an hour and 15 minutes, which is way longer than I thought I would go. So, yeah, that's a good question. Why are they redated? Uh, you see, I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to get into the whole uh, issue with um, the Mandela effect. So, yeah, I appreciate you guys all being here. It's just a hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, and rewriting it, at least on the Internet anyway. So, um, the only Mandela effect that I can personally attest to is the J.C. Penny thing. Because I used to, in high school, have a job at one of these little mall cafeterias. And it was attached, like, right next to the J.C. Penny's in the mall. And I used to have to park under, like, share, subscribe. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. See you next time.